Okay, so Kim, I'm, I guess you want me just to go straight into reading about Chuck? or else why are we even doing this? If I don't think I'd cut out all the fun stuff, because that to me is the fun stuff. Build that audience, because if you've got no one to sell it to, then it's just going to flop and die, and no one likes a floppy, right? I'm yet to meet a woman who just kind of grew up confidently in her body. Welcome to my podcast. I'm Nicole Bremner. Join my weekly conversations with really interesting people as I delve into the stories and experiences that make them uniquely them. Hello and welcome back to another podcast. I'm nearly at 100. Can you believe that? Nearly at 100 podcasts, episodes. Today, this podcast, I am joined by Charles R. Wolfe, or Chuck, as he is known. And he's a London-based multinational urbanism consultant, author, visiting scholar in Sweden, recent Fulbright specialist in Australia for an award-winning project, and longtime American environmental land use lawyer. Before leaving Seattle in late 2017, he had 34 years of experience in environmental land use and real estate law and held leadership positions in both the legal and planning professions. He served as a long-term affiliate associate professor in the College of the Built Environments in the University of Washington in Seattle. He's also the author of Seeing the Better City, which was the finalist for the 2018 United Kingdom National Urban Design Award, an urbanism without effort. And somewhere between character and caricature, there exists an authentic, a truly unique urban place that blends global and local, old and new. Yet, in a dramatically changing world dominated by the crises of climate change, maintaining public health and social justice, Finding such places and explaining their relevance may be easier said than done. Wolf will discuss on a global basis how many interrelated facets of an urban area's unique yet dynamic context, built, social, cultural and intangible, can be championed and advanced rather than simply borrowed from another place. I love that passage and that is on the press release and the uh, blurb of Charles's latest book. But anyway, enough from me, Charles, oh, Chuck, thanks for being on our podcast today. That was a very long introduction. Sorry about that. But I love that passage and uh, blurb from your book. So Chuck, thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, it's an honor. And as you know, you helped inspire that passage. That's why you like it so much <laughs> from our <conference. laughs> Anyway, thank you again. Oh, we'll come on to that. But uh, yeah, I'm really curious, actually, as to how your books and how this interest within the the built environment and the cultures came about. And was there a, a particular... Uh, instance in your life where you where it really piqued your interest well that's you know it's, it's complicated as always but but maybe not so much um, for me um, it was it was really easy in the sense that I was the son of an urban planning professor and one of the the pioneers of the urban design profession in the United States who worked a lot internationally. He founded the modern uh, urban design and planning program at the University of Washington and was really among a founding generation of um, land use planning in the United States that ironically inherited a lot of ideas from the uh, the post-war new towns of, of, of where we are now and, and uh, you know, and, and, and really many multinational facets. Phrased more simply, I got to travel a lot as a kid and was shown so many places that I really never forgot. And I think the question of what inspired you to sort of change from being a practicing lawyer in the United States, say, 10 years ago, to start writing about cities, 
I think that was simply the American recession where digital publications in the United States were simply reaching out for copy from people in the community, professionals in the community to start blogging and writing. Um, and that's how it all started. That's how the writing all started. It recalled memories from many, many years before. So that's the story. And this is uh, this change in your career and in your direction that came after, as I said in the introduction, you're a one time environmental and land use lawyer, and now you're an author. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what do you think? How did you change from being an author, and when did you stop practicing the law? It, it was um, it was gradual, so that 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 post recession um, commencement of writing was really on the side, and it was first for local publications in Seattle, who needed, you know, one of Seattle's daily newspapers went entirely digital and laid off most of its staff. So as noted, they needed people to provide content on different subjects. That was the very first thing because I started writing about cities. And as I recall, the first column I wrote was pretty legally oriented it's about the permitting system, the entitlement system in Washington state and Seattle and why the development boom, you know, how the development boom might restart after the, the recession because there was a boom in place just before. And then it was opportunities. It was in the days where um, still, online people publications actually sought me out to write that doesn't happen so much anymore because everything's been reinvented and uh, there there are now online staffs and so on and so forth but that's how it happened and and I was always I was practicing law until we left the United States in late 2017 as you also mentioned but increasingly, the author bit was taking more and more time because I was already into my well into my second book and um, publicizing that and following opportunities that had come from it. And then since being in the UK and Europe, it's been really 95% author and some consulting relating to the urbanism stuff. Very little law. Yeah. And it's it's beautifully put about how you you say that the study of what it means for a city or town to acknowledge and honor its traditional identity or essence as it transitions into something new you've so eloquently put that and yet learn our, our, our planning law and this study or this way that towns and cities change are inextricably linked, aren't they? Because the decisions yeah, are made by the law. <laughs> absolutely, and both in the United States and, and, and now here with the many challenges that are um, that are at play here with regard to housing and um, aesthetics, which, which are, again, as, as you know, very important in the United Kingdom. Um, there is that interplay and I think I've chosen um, to immerse myself incredibly much into it, so much that I confuse myself to death um, because there are no easy answers. And I tend to write in ways that um, I can't even recognize when someone else reads them back to me because they reflect this sort of mental struggle I was having at the time that I wrote those words. I literally don't remember writing what you just wrote. <laughs> yeah. And so the new book, and I don't, I don't want to necessarily talk about the new book, but I do want to say that it is correlative to a personal struggle, a personal transition from lawyer to something else. And also reflective of many of the things that are happening as we emerge from the pandemic, most of which I wrote before the pandemic. Because one, I said I wasn't going to talk about the book, but it oh, reminds me. Oh no, I would like one, to talk about this. Uh, well, okay. Well, then, if you'll if you'll bear with me, one of the major paragraphs in that book, I think, one of my favorite paragraphs is early on when I say 
Imagine if the world around you disappeared and the paths to which you were so accustomed suddenly went away and you had to reinvent your understanding of the relationships between where you live and the city around you. Certainly there would be, you know, in Dublin, one would not replicate the Dublin of James Joyce. You would not uh, replicate classical Greece when in Athens and so on and so forth, or the London of Charles Dickens. Well, guess what? I wrote that before the pandemic, but I, you know, if I don't say so myself, it's kind of spot on. And I was purposely jumping back in some cases, 2000 years to these idyllic, nostalgic views of places that often tourists have when they come visit to say at the outset, look, enough with the touristic experience or the uh, classical fantasy as driving our understanding of a particular place. We need to do the work, we need to dig in, but this is not a heritage book by any stretch of the word. You, some of you are gonna think that by the cover and the title, but read a little bit. And I'm talking about so many is issues of justice, equity, nature, built environment, climate, and so on and so forth. So that that invitation to reimagine, um, I'm I'm quite proud of because it fits very well with where we all where we all are right now. Yeah, and your book, which is sustaining a city's culture and character, it is, as you say, so much more than a heritage book. It really is looking at all that uh, touches lives because lives exist within towns and cities and uh, urban environments quite often. And it, it touches on all of those things in such a, a beautiful and comprehensive way. And the book, I've been lucky enough to have a review copy while I wait for my own to be delivered imminently. Uh, but it's, it really does, uh, look at so much as as you've said before the climate change and maintaining public health social justice uh looking at the uh the planning and attitudes towards that but how how important are these aspects in shaping the future city and what do you mean by the essence i guess of a city mm -hmm. Well, um, I think that uh, I'm not going to flip the question on you, but I could, <laughs> knowing that what you know some of the some of the blending you do with your own developments, which is how we met. But we'll maybe we'll get to that in a bit. I think the essence means look, this is not easy, and it's a time as we emerge from the pandemic. It's a new time for for um, rankings and laundry lists and recipes and menus and. Um, if I may say so, consultants seeking revenue to help cities, towns, and villages revision themselves. Um, and this is not the stuff of, um, and I've said this in my other books as well, but now I really say it, this is not the stuff of a punch list. This is part punch list, part science, part art, part social science, and part day-to-day -day reality, personal histories, and part dream. And if we deny that, we are making a big mistake in terms of creating environments which reflect today's realities. I think the popular media and um, people who write short clips, brief pieces, on these issues, which used to be me, um, are only scraping the surface. That's one sort of cynical view of all this. The flip side is, isn't it wonderful that the things that used to be the province of urban planning or architectural education, or you know, name any intellectual pursuit you like, are now being presented back to people who actually live in communities in ways that 
and the term the term of art is co-creation or co-create and, and where more people can have a voice. So in, in an ideal world, this essence question that you like would be top down, bottom up, and where the two meet. And where the two meet is going to vary based on another magic word for me, and it's the word that I like to use probably the most, context. And, you know, the local input is going to be one thing in one place. The power of government is going to be one thing in another place. But people need to take the time to figure out this blend. People need to realize that if one does not allow for a meaningful immersion, a process that may take some time, then things may be, end up being um, even more uh, cookie cutter or more divisive. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the book, a lot of the book, which may not come through initially, is about what? It's about listening. And the examples in the book are about successes and failures where people didn't do the work and they paid the consequences or where people did do the work in very simple ways um, and perhaps created a superior result. So the essence, again, is very contextual and it takes patience, work, and so it's something that, now you know better than this, but it's something to which developers are often accused not having the patience and the, you know, the, the immersive attitude. They, you know, often the cynical assumption is, eh, they just want to make the most money possible. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that's true, but oftentimes it is not. So I have some methods in the book that try and help call this essence out, but they are not prescriptive. They are door openers. And that frustrates some people, but that's the way I operate. Yeah. yeah, and I want to go over your learn uh, okay. as well. But first of all, I want to just go back to essence and uh, just dig a little deeper on that and look at political correctness and how this, how it can be uh, sometimes difficult to to talk about the way that a city is changing. And let me give you an example: is when I first moved over to Europe from Australia. I, I did a lot of traveling and I'd never been to Europe before. And I went to I went to Paris and Paris has always been a very mixed black and white city where uh, it, it was just, I'd, I'd, I'd never seen such a diverse city in my life as when I went to Paris. I then went to Copenhagen and it looked like every single person was born of the same mother <laughs> everyone looked the same the city all had the, had this this feel about it and then when I went to uh, Copenhagen about three years ago it was incredibly different it was a much more diverse uh, culture people looked different the people serving me in restaurants and at the hotels they, it, it just looked different. No one looked like they were born of the same parents anymore. And obviously that's a change and that has to be embraced. But is there is there a politically correct way of, of discussing this change and the change with uh, migration on that and that and how that impacts a city? Um, I, I think there is, and I think it's to be as, um, transparent as possible in a way that um, that you just were. I mean, I don't think your description would be seen as offensive or um, ethnocentric in any way. And of course, in the United States, um, partly after coming out of a rather oppressive political four years, uh, people are very open and driven on these issues of progressiveness and um, multiple origins and um, so on and so forth. Um, I think it's a matter of simple acknowledgements such as you just made and 
building trust as a result. I mean, that's where things get more difficult, I think. It's not only stating things properly. I think you used the term clinical correctness. I would have said political correctness or whatever we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. but, but um, nonetheless, I think it's trust building. And we, we all have to be careful because you know this, when you reach out to consult with neighbors about a project, how do you convince them? And they are sometimes diverse populations, depending on the area of a city one is working in. How do you convince them you're really, you're not just checking off the boxes. You're not just going through um, uh, whatever regulatory processes, uh, requirements that you consult mm -hmm. locally or with certain uh, um, I lost you for a sec. Are we okay? Yeah, we're back. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so just to say, it's 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 not just box checking. It's about um, a, a, you know assuring that um, trust is built, and and so one example in the book, one of my favorite examples is. Um, Although it allowed, it, it was based on monetary underwriting by a mining company in Sweden that had caused damage to the underpinnings of the town of Kiruna up in Lapland, they had to move the, a good part of the town. They're in the process right now of moving a good part of the town from the old town to the new town. Wow. And... There's a certain luxury that was built into the process, but I think it's important to note that a, a retired planning professor was commissioned as sort of the, the lead planner. They did use an architecture firm to, to, in Stockholm to do a master plan, but he was the, he was the, the leader of the project, let's just say. He moved from Stockholm to Karuna and spent months sitting down, having coffees, immersing, getting to know the place, and, and really helping to formulate what would be brought from the old town to the new. And the book has some photos, but it, 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 it sparked these amazing essence space, to use your, again, the, the concept you're honing in on, these amazing essence based conversations, which is, um, Karina has one of the most classic, um, a very, very um, um, honored church of Northern Swedish architecture, one of the most notable churches in the country. Well, they were going to move the church, and it's, a, it's an engineering feat that is not quite accomplished. But the question is, this is what comes up. Well, if, you, if you're moving the church, what about the cemetery? Mm -hmm. What about the look and feel of the woods next door and the particular view off of the hill that the church is on? What, what about uh, moving into the town? What about the bench upon which I met my wife 40 years ago? What about, you know, and this can go on and on, but the sum total is, and I was really privileged to be able to spend a couple of days in Karina with Joran Karls, this gentleman who I described. Now, the new town hall externally does not look like the old town hall, but one walks in to the setting of the open hall um, and the relationships are the same. The stairway, the what there's a feeling of familiarity that the architects were tasked with with addressing. Um, building materials are used on the facing uh, that are uh, reminiscent of the the old town, but they did not, um, such as was the case post World War II and. Germany, Netherlands, Poland. They did not say we elect to rebuild the town as it looked in 1877, because that's you know kind of who we are. It was a much more um, immersive, um, essence-based 
project. And so essence is all of the, this is why we go through it well, it's part dream, it's part experience, it's part um, all of the things I listed before, art, science, and both. And, you know, sure, um, you know, here where I sit in Newbury right now, where, you know, there are questions to, about um, replanning um, shopping malls that have fallen a bit out of use because of the pandemic or otherwise, um, you know, you, you may not have the benefit of that, you know, of a multi-year process, but we should try and replicate that as best we can. Now, what does that mean? That means we're not going to just use surveys. We're not going to just use meetings where the loudest person will prevail. We're, we're, we're going to use a mix of techniques that benefit from the digital learning of the pandemic, but also call upon some very, very elemental human attributes like listening and sitting down and having a coffee and talking things through. Um, anyway, I, yeah. long answer, but I think it, again, circles around that essence um, concept. Exactly. And yeah, talking to the loudest person in the room doesn't uh, give the the view of the room, does it? It gives the viewpoint of that particular person. One thing that was very uh, made very real to me just over the weekend, actually, was the extent of the damage in Europe post-wars. And there's a fantastic uh, series on YouTube, actually, where uh, someone's taken all the old film footage and using AI has transformed into colour. And um, mm -hmm. have you seen that? Yes, I've yes. seen that and variations of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and great. it's it is incredible just to see the the extent of the damage and then how these have how these buildings and how the cities have been rebuilt and it's like you say in some instances they have chosen to rebuild in the own old style but in others they've chosen to go with the modern uh, modern building and how how damaging is it potentially if we if all cities move down a modern route or a, a route to what is modern right now and become mm -hmm. homogenous and mm -hmm. will we get these well, sprawling urban environments that all just yeah. blend the other <laughs> you don't know well, if you're possibly in... <laughs> yeah Whatever's... possibly yeah 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 i mean very possibly and this is where it the answer is one that's full of finesse and needs to check people's ego at the door um, because a lot of people on this type of question have a particular movement that they're um, championing um, for how things should proceed and assume that everything that came before is wrong. Um, and maybe it's touted, everything that came before is touted as ugly uh, the result of um, a non-participatory uh, approach that did not involve the people or for whatever reason. Well, um, yes, uh, that is true. But there are some other things that may be true. And that is that we need to look at the, con the context of what happened um, before and understand why it happened before we go forward. Now, I think a classic example is here in the uh, in England, where um, so many um, so many areas of damage, um, say in in the in the London boroughs, uh, the the bomb craters were filled by social housing or forms of housing that were meant to be much more temporary than they ended up being. And the question is how to climb out of that in an affordable way without simply saying everything we did before was was wrong. Um, it's I think it's fair to acknowledge um, um, inappropriate periods of, of insensitivity to architecture. But before we do that, let's understand the stories behind it. Now, um, I think that there is a danger in um, a uniformity that is followed for what we would now say are all the right reasons, uh, climate sensitivity, um, 
affordability and so on and so forth without, again, a thoughtful contextual mix. I mean, you know, Nicole, I, I, you are, you know, on, in the book, page 80, bottom of page 80 and 81. I mean, I, um, I need to tell this story. I hope, I, I hope it's okay. You're the host, you're the host here, but, but no, so uh, here's the story. Um, on you know on social media, which is um, you know admittedly something we didn't have uh, thirty twenty or maybe even ten years ago to the extent that this story proceeds. Um, back in autumn of two thousand nineteen, you were I think under your East Eight moniker, you were opening one of your new projects in I think in Hackney, and the it was. Um, it was very well subscribed. You were getting a lot of attention. It was, if you don't mind my saying so, a bit glitzy, but the messaging that you put forth led me to believe that you were someone that might understand this blending um, in the ways that we're discussing. I never expected to hear from you, but I sent you a note. Two months later, you wrote back, which is, somewhat phenomenal in these times to begin with but and i thank you for that and we spoke on the, by telephone as i recall and you were very busy but you took the time and your first instance of or your first response when we when i was asking you the same kind of things you're talking about now you said oh you know i'm not sure i have much to offer here mm -hmm. um i think a lot of these issues are taste driven i think they are um a bit um mechanical I think, you know, um, but what I do is I use, um, I do use a, a very, uh, you know, I use indigenous architects. I do, I think what you said basically is I may use good materials, but other than that, I am very focused on a, var a variety of the issues we've talked about here today, affordability and so on and so forth. And what you said was, I, may no, I might not use London brick if I can avoid it, mm -hmm. but I pick up the curve of the street. Uh, if I vary height, it's tasteful and consistent. And I, in so many words, you said, I have a process that I follow to best understand my properties. And so um, all that being said, I think that is the answer. You have, without meaning diminutive is bad, you have smaller projects where you have the bandwidth and perhaps the the flexibility to do this yeah. but um it it is really really critical and i have other friends who operate the same way and i think these projects are to be looked at for um their magic mixture just like kiruna or just like another example in the book about why the app you know pre-pandemic and this will be back why the apple store town hall approach, town center approach. It might have worked in Covent Garden uh, when it first, you know, was developing, but it failed in Stockholm and Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, what did Apple do wrong? And Apple presumed that they were the great progressive future and that, and, and that everyone would embrace their, their approach. Well, in those particular cities, they did not. For contextual reasons of this of the places that they were trying to develop federation square in melbourne which had its history and also you know environmental and indigenous concerns and in stockholm along um, in kingster garden uh, you know um, the king's park which was historically the park of the people and had a very heralded history so i think um you know, I think that, yes, there is, there's a danger in uniformity, even if it's very, very well intentioned. It yeah. might not work everywhere. Yeah, I, and I think that one of the benefits of being a smaller boutique house builder is that you can, um, sorry, just turn this off, is that you can be very, uh i guess nimble and also you can really shape the environment that you're in rather than 
larger house builders they are creating an area and so they are, they have to maximize profit whereas for us boutique developers we can really focus on the streetscape and ensure that we've got uh, just a, a really uh, beautiful development that we're offering and, and not necessarily trying to maximize uh, profit in that regard and that's what I've always enjoyed about being a, a boutique developer. So uh, yeah, as I said, Chuck, thanks so much for including my my little piece in your book. And it <laughs> well, it, lovely to see yeah, that. I mean, it's, well, but it was very. Um, it was what at that particular time I had hoped, you know, that um, I would find someone who would parlay what you just said, and so um, it was perfect. I mean, that's why, as I recall. When you said, I'm not sure I have a lot to offer, I said, yes, you do. Let's, <laughs> let's chat more. And um, so as you, it really helped reorient my thinking at a time that, um, you know, I was, by that time, I was not a stranger to London or to, to England or the UK, but I was still reaching out to find people who might be able to illuminate local um, examples, just as I did with the, the Business Improvement District uh, adjacent to Waterloo uh, along Lower Marsh, uh, We Are Waterloo. Uh, uh, Natalie Raven, who's the CEO of uh, We Are Waterloo, played a tremendous role um, as well um, in informing this magical mixture of history, jumpstarting a, a, a market reality, um, introduced me to another of my favorite stories in the book, a, f a fruit vendor that began as one guy at Covent Garden in the old Covent Garden, but now is solely internet delivery based, but still carries the same customer service um, ethic through the um, son or grandson of the original founder. Um, and that's the story I tell in the book, that's Bobtail Fruit. Um, and, you know, this is an important one and I'm, you know, I'm going off topic a bit, but this is an important one because bobtail fruit to a tourist who loves Borough Market, say, might be, oh, isn't it a shame they don't have a stall mm. anymore? The world is falling apart. You know, a typical old London vet fruit veg vendor is no more. The answer to that is, Polar opposite. Mm. Those they have figured out how to do it contextually in today's era. And by the way, they ramped up during the pandemic with their residential customers because they'd obviously lost a, uh, an office clientele. Yeah. And so these are the stories of I think these are the remarkable stories of the pandemic and post pandemic that that we need to look at in a more holistic way. And uh, another plug, Joseph Young at Bobtail Fruit was of enormous assistance. And that story is somewhere early in the book as well. And that's what's beautiful about your book is that you have woven in these stories and these examples throughout the book and, and also your beautiful photography and pictorial examples of, of what you're talking about. You've also got Learn, which is Learn, Look, Engage, Assess, Review, uh negotiate I'm trying to read my writing yes. and you <laughs> in the book and this methodology so take us through what this methodology is used for and how you came up with it okay um thank you very very much um because um i i often don't get a chance to you know take this deep dive and and it's great um so in the second book um, I'm just very, very briefly. I wrote the first book, Urban Invisibilism Without Effort, was about fundamental relationships between people and cities and how we must understand them before we go forward. It was a very junior version of the current book. Um, the second book was much more substantial, but it picked up on the photographic element and talked about how to um, enable people to understand their cities based on. Um, an affirmative approach to say Instagram, rather than just posting the photos and la la la, here I am in Paris. Let's just talk about you know what what resonates and why this photo is being posted. And I even had 
by that time, because it was 2016, I had a lot of ideas about how cities might receive the visual as testimony, if you will, and compel a more visual dialogue. Um, well, fast forward a little bit more. I went to your native Australia and um, um, was blessed with an American Fulbright Specialist Award to uh, work with um, um, a university in uh, Cairns and Townsville. Um, and um, the idea was we were going to do a United Nations Urban Thinkers Campus, which is a, an experiment in public involvement as to how the method of my second book would 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 um, improve a community development process. The acronym then was LENS: Look, Explore, Narrate, and Summarize. It was very two-dimensional, and I learned through that experience that I needed to be much more focused um, in an ecumenical way, in a holistic way, towards things beyond the physical not just architecture, not just being able to see, because someone pointed out, you know, Chuck, not everyone can see. And my answer was, oh, I thought I'd handle that by saying my tool, the urban diary could also be written or recorded or so on and so forth. But um, a population in need of um, inclusion was identified to me. I also was asked a lot of questions in Australia about indigenous populations in and around Cairns. And I was told, look, um, Aboriginal populations can be remarkable with cell phones, but in terms of some of the other technologies you're suggesting, um, maybe not. So what are you gonna do about that? So anyway, hence came the new acronym, which is far more inclusive. And that magic negotiate at the end is a, is a shout out to the co-creation, the interaction with stakeholders. So we've gone from look, explore, narrate, and summarize to look, engage, assess, review, and negotiate. It's an action forcer, okay? And I guess my hope would be, and some people have told me I'm onto something, that if people keep those words in their mind, they can custom design a local process that can meet um, the the envelopes enabled by those words. Now, there's another piece of it, and that is all about context. And it's not it's not just learn, it's learn with context keys. And the context keys, and this is getting a bit high-minded, and why people are sometimes impatient with my writing, but there's not, not just a textbook, it's meant to be, as I said, immersive and action-forcing. The context keys are, um, familiarity, congruity, and integrity. So when you walk into a familiar environment, when you're indulging in the learned method, why is this familiar? Why is this familiar? Congruity means, you know, it, why is it, you know, relational to what we're trying to do here? Let's say I want to build X. You know, I, it's the, you know, this is familiar and, you know, th what I'm seeing relates to the goal, but then, you know, that's the congruence. But then the integrity is, are we really behaving in a way that's contextually intrinsic to this place? That, that, that marries with the negotiate of, of, of learn. So, uh, you know, again, a bit high-minded, I'm not being self-apologetic, I'm just saying it's complicated. And these, the tools that can interweave can be data-driven, they can be um, very simple, like having a coffee, or um, by an all, involvement of a Paris-based artist named Kadeen Navarro in the book, um, who's uh, actually ironically off to landscape architecture school soon, but she um, pioneered an artistic process that is not dissimilar because she grew up in, Japan moved to her father's native France with an American mother and has made a, a, an art, artist career out of understanding a place based on familiarities, multicultural familiarities. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's learn and it, it, 
it's not easily explained if someone is considerate enough to ask me to explain it uh, as you have been. With and the whole idea of this is to take uh, very simply put it's just to really take in all that we're absorbing in all its forms and i think you said to me once in our earlier discussion that it will allow people to be a better tourist even because you'll be able to take in so yeah. much more and it, that's a very simple way of, of putting it though <laughs> no 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 it's not i mean one thing that it, this goes back to book two, Seeing the Better City, which still has life to it. In fact, Seeing the Better City is being read by a UK EU urbanism book club and is appearing virtually as part of the um, Jane's Walk Festival in London by Jane's Walk London in honor of Jane Jacobs, the epic urbanist. So that book still has life, even though it's two dimensional. When I was doing book talks on that book, I went, in 2016 to San Francisco to speak to um, some young professionals uh, for a lunch uh, sponsored by the Urban Land Institute, which is of course here in the UK as well. And those assembled were all portfolio managers and whatnot for major um, real estate companies. And in fact, um, it was held in the offices of Grosvenor, uh, but in San Francisco. Um, and I think someone might actually have been from the UK, you know, estate-based company Grosvenor. Um, but I was shocked because in my inclusivity, I always am one of these people who goes around the room and it was a small enough group and says, oh, well, you know, tell me about why you're here or what are you hoping to get out of this talk. And they all said, all of them, uh, they were somewhat ap apologetically, well, I, I, I'm really not here for my work. I'm here because I travel a lot from my work and I'm looking for a way to understand the cities where I visit. Now, again, that was book two. I think book three is even better. But I said, with false incredulity, I said, what do you mean you're not here from work? Don't you think that that understanding adds value to your employer's portfolio? Don't you know that the markets are picking up on this stuff as something that works and can enhance the profitability thereof? So yeah, that group was saying, oh, I'm here to be a better tourist. But um they they also were there to be i i like to fantasize to be better real estate portfolio managers as, as well and i do spend a lot of time in the book poking a bit of fun uh, there's an example of um, someone who went to paris and was from my perspective dead set in classical paris on the left bank and all of the opportunities available to them and they stayed there one night and they and, and they moved to the right bank because they wanted to experience the real Paris. And it's like, <laughs> you know, they wanted to see the, they wanted to see the Eiffel Tower, you know, and it, so. Yeah. I do recall a trip to Paris where we asked the concierge for a list of restaurants that we should go to. And then I was very disappointed that they were all modern <laughs> and none of them were. Yeah traditional as I expected Parisian restaurants but uh, with uh, talking about uh, being international you you were just talking about the uh, Japanese American French lady and the way that she was able to have this methodology for the uh, landscape and for, for art and you also said that it was moving abroad that helped shape the idea of uh, this this third book, sustaining a city's culture and character. Do you think that it's that really immersing yourself in another culture and uh, and also perhaps being of three different cultures, like that uh, Japanese French American lady, that really helps you have this have a, a better, I guess, understanding of what makes a city? 
Well, I, I, I think so, yes. Um, um, I think we go back to your first question, and that is, what is it that motivated you, or in some respects, why are you still driven to write about this stuff? And well, I had those exposures as a youngster. Um, my, my friends used to make fun of me because I would say, not meaning to sound high-minded, but I would simply say, oh, I've been to Europe six times, you know, and they, and, but, you know, it created, I mean, to your point, and I don't know if you feel this about your journey as well, um, but it, it, it's, a, it's also a, um, a bit of um, the literature based Thomas Wolfe, no relation, you can't go home again type of reality. I think as a very young person living in Copenhagen at age three, living in Milan at age nine, living in what is now Slovenia twice at age 13, all through academic opportunities of my father, I went home and it didn't feel the same. And so I think it's that sort of um, um, lack of, you know, maybe feeling like I didn't fit in um uh, that led to my fascination with context and my understanding that you know in, in the second book i have a fo two photos one in arusha tanzania and one in seattle of a starbucks store um saying these are the same things across the world and one was a in arusha a shop mm. with a woman on a cell phone expressive weather big big clouds um infrastructure you know that looks very different in arusha from seattle uh, uh curb and street and so on and so forth we we this is where it's easy to get back to um the um you know the great danish architect and urbanist jan gale's emphasis on we're all homo sapiens we're all human um these are the things that happen everywhere and all of this is translation. So definitely that mul these multicultural exposures. I'll tell you one more story that's in the book. Uh, Please. Um, when, when we were renting our flat in London, I paid um, one of the gentlemen who was part of um, um, the landlord or the managing company's uh, team that fixed something to come back and help fix something else that was perhaps something the tenant should pay for. I, I paid him extra to come back on a weekend. And I'm not going to name names because he might get in trouble if I tell him that, if I tell this story too, too, in too much detail. But um, no, but it's, I, in the book, he's called Plamen the Handyman. And so, you know, um, he came, he painted the ceiling or whatever it was he was doing. And he looked at me and he said, so, how do you like it here? And I said, oh, well, you know, I like it well enough. How do you like it here? Where are you from? He said he was from Bulgaria. And he said, you know how it is. Everywhere is the same, except in some places, things are better. You know, everywhere we have the home, we have work, we have the food, and it just sort of varies you know, but it's all the same, isn't it? And I said, wait a minute. And I sort of jotted it down and it ended up being a major driver of, of the book and very much in keeping with the question you just asked, I think, that people who jump around can see these things mm -hmm. express in slightly different ways. When they go home, however, they may, they may not, people may turn off, they may not want to hear they may want to hear a more exciting story about, oh yes, in Copenhagen, the bike lanes were brilliant, you know, um, which is true, but that's not the whole story. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it, it is interesting that uh, the, uh, your handyman had that view. And I wonder if it's because it's the difference between taking your home with you or, immersing yourself in the culture so if you take your home with mm -hmm. you and you shop at 
Eastern European shops so that you can get all the the usual stuff that you that you consume back home and uh, rather than eat English or <laughs> Australian or whatever yeah. it might be fair yeah. I wonder if that's part of it uh, yeah it, it is interesting yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm probably. I like to think that I'm of the type that immerses myself, but actually, I'm probably very much like your uh, your handyman. <laughs> there are just different things to see outside and different uh, ways of communicating. Yeah, I mean, I I think I think it's. I mean, I I I wouldn't want to be tested against some of my statements in the book either, you know. Uh, um, but I try my best to explore um, in ways consistent with um, with what I prescribe, and you know, even though pre prescribes a strong word, I don't want to be seen as a prescriptor. What I suggest, mm -hmm. um, and I've I've done a lot of exploring um, and feel very fortunate to have to have done so and um you know even even where we live now just to understand the context of the particular place where we live i mean the the second battle of newbury and the english civil war started about um, 20 feet from where i'm sitting right now um and um i i have my metal detector and someday i'm going to find some spoils <laughs> um but that's important. I have a landscape architecture friend um, in Seattle who I interviewed actually for my um, on on hiatus um, video series that came out of the book. I did 18 of these things called Place Parts and then had such a great time talking to, to her, her that I thought, I don't need to do this anymore. Her name is Shannon Nickel and her her approach in her firm and they they are a national firm based in seattle they've done some amazing projects around the united states she fancies herself as the one who who seeks out the ghosts in the landscape and maybe sketches them as part of a the initial studies um for for a particular project often a landscape you know a park project um, they did the gardens for the Gates Foundation in Seattle. They they were involved in the the national and in, in the fountain and the national capital number in some work in Boston and you know just some, some very very great projects. Um, Millennium part of Millennium Park in Chicago and so on. But I asked her. I said, "Well, Shannon, because you immerse in this way, looking for the ghosts of the landscape, and perhaps you hope to pick up in a you know a, a historic." Um, grade of the hill that isn't there anymore or in some cases something lost to history does that mean that it's going to be designed into the project and she said no and for me that's a great answer because i'd say that in my lawyer years there were people who came in and felt they had to make a great design statement, a water feature or some such thing. And they didn't like me as a lawyer saying, good luck in terms of getting that permitted. You know, um, I don't mean to, you know, excuse me, I don't mean to, you know, insult your, your flamboyance, but you know, you might think a little bit differently because from the client's perspective, it may be a bit wasteful to go down that path because I'm not sure it's going to be permitted by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers or whoever the regulator was, but the you know the opportunity to study a place um, and immerse in it, and I'm using these words again, and not necessarily use it going forward, but to understand that's what you're receiving, is is so important, and maybe maybe sometimes just sometimes that justifies the facadism of which people can be contempt contemptuous of oh yeah you know great you, you you kept a wall and it because it was too expensive to keep the rest of the building well really well maybe sometimes that's the best solution in in context sometimes re regulations prescribe it back yeah. to you one of your opening questions sometimes it's right sometimes it's not 
so yeah it's all in context and so as we wrap up now chuck because we could keep talking for another hour i'm sure <laughs> You, yeah. You've written that this is the third of, and it's the final book of your trilogy, uh, uh -huh. designed to raise awareness of the intrinsic identity of urban places and the importance of avoiding urban renewal that's out of scale, context, or character. I just thought I'd put that in there because uh -huh. it sounds lovely. Uh, so is, is there a fourth book? And I was thinking that perhaps something along the lines of... Uh, the rural and you've got here in your discussion points that the how regional communities can transfer transform the identity of local areas to enhance livability so i'm now thinking about something along yeah. the lines of, of rural spaces and the essence and culture of those. <laughs> <laughs> um well you know i i've really I, this has been a this has been a tough year because of the pandemic and publication schedules turning upside down and you know things like that and it it has been sometimes more frustrating than such an epic adventure should be and i've thought a lot about well what's next and when can i turn this off and get you know my dad's voice out of my head and do something really interesting and i have thought about um i have thought about um what you know something like you describe um because um there's um for instance in um uh, the new edition of um, of his epic textbook, um, uh, Matthew Carmona at UCL, who he's you know one of the leading, if not the leading, urban design academic in in the UK. Um, he and was a kind uh, reviewer of this book, by the way. He's on the, the back cover or the web page or whatever. He talks about a reframed understanding of urban design that receives the urban landscape much in the way that my friend Shannon um, described as well. Uh, and you know, living here, just adjacent to the North Wessex Downs um, area, area, area of outstanding national natural beauty, that's on my mind because if you've followed my Instagram feed, um, more often than not, I'm posting things of, uh, you know, that are rural nature and that you know address the river lambert and the relationships between so um i may i may take your suggestion most seriously but right now i'm sort of perplexed because i'm i'm trying to get these ideas still out there much more um and maybe the next book will be a work of fiction um i don't know <laughs> maybe there won't be a next book but i've you know, maybe if we can reconnect um, in midsummer, I'll have a better, <laughs> I'll have a better answer. <laughs> That's right. It's uh, yeah, you're you're still in this uh, bubble of this book and uh, sustaining right. the city's culture and character. So uh, it's a bit unfair of me to ask what's next. But no, no, it's it, it's good that you did. It's good that you did. <laughs> where can people get hold of your beautiful book? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so it depends what country you're in, which country you're in. Um, here in the UK, um, Blackwells, um, out of the classic Blackwells out of Oxford online, may be the best place for now. Um, it is um, coming into stock everywhere. I, we're calling this the UK release season. I know Blackwells has them in stock. Um, mm -hmm. And that would be for someone who might want to get it today here in the UK. Now, I will say digitally, Kindle wise, you know, it's readily available, both Kindle, Kobo, all the on uh, Apple books, no problem. But if you want the hard copy, Blackwell's has it now and soon um, everyone else will. Amazon, Waterston's, uh, the Royal Institute of British Architects, W. H. Smith, all of them will will have it very very shortly. So Blackwell's is the answer, or the digital versions online. If you happen to be in the United States or somewhere that's an easy um, ship from the United States, you can order through the publisher Roman and Littlefield um, uh, quite easily, um, or it is on Amazon in the United States right now. So that's my answer. 
Okay, so I will cancel my Amazon order and I will pick one up at Blackwell's because even though I've got a review copy, I really want a hard copy because there's a place on my coffee table for that book. And uh, yeah, as, as Chuck said, I well, feature on page 80. <laughs> so I need a signed copy. Well, yeah. I need to, um, well, 80, I need to bring my copy to be signed. Well, but yeah, page 80 and page 205, as I recall, there's a look back on the teachings of Nicole Bremner. But I do want to say that I can't thank you enough for doing this. This is how things should go, that people find each other that have maybe some similar outlooks um, and they they reflect upon each other. And um, the reciprocity you've shown by having me on your, your excellent podcast um, is amazing because I know that sometimes you have real estate people, but sometimes you have um, so many diverse people from, you know, issues of, of it's just all sorts of things that are that are you know perhaps far removed from what we're talking about today and it's such an honor um to be on a, a a show like that because it means that maybe the message is getting out there a little bit that thinking hard is a, an okay thing to do for everyone yes yes exactly <laughs> and i think that um yeah so many people would benefit from the the essence of your book, Chuck. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, oh, absolutely! All the best with your UK season. Yeah, and, and all the best with all of your endeavors. And I'm sure that um, before too long, we'll have a chance to cross paths somewhere in England. Sounds great. Thank so, you. Thank, thank you.